I'm going to share with you all some a message that I've never shared before in a passage that I've talked about more times than I can count. So, but the Bible is infinite and we're finite. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it reads us while we read it. That's right. And um, sometimes when it reads us, it shows us stuff um, that we've missed in the past. And so praise God for his infinite truth. All right. Um, we're going to look at Daniel chapter three today. Daniel chapter three. I'm going to read 15 verses. Um, pray for me as I read out loud because I read better when I'm reading silently. Then nobody hears my mistakes. It's all good, though. So Daniel chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. And then we're going to look at the entire passage, the entire chapter. Because I believe, I believe that all good preaching is teaching. Yeah. Yeah. And so if you get excited and you don't learn something, well, then what good is it, right? It, it'll, it'll wear off by the time you get out of the parking lot. Um, if it... Um, if it if you learn, if you if you feel good, and you don't, and you learn something, that's better. But if you learn something, you don't do something. Then what? Then what? Right. So we need to do something as well. And so we're going to read uh, Daniel chapter three, verses one through. Yeah, y'all can be seated. Sorry about that. Daniel chapter three, verses one through fifteen, and says, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits. By the way, I'm going to talk to you today about. Let me just tell you what I'm going to talk to you about. Stand up. Speak up. Yeah. And show up. Stand up, speak up, and show up. And I believe we live in an age where that's very, very absent in society. People who are willing to stand up are very absent. People who are willing to speak up are absent. And therefore, people who show up as their true, authentic self, who God created them to be doing what God told them to do, they're very, very, very absent from our society today. Everybody is walking around attempting to be a carbon copy of everybody else, and that's impossible. As my good friend Pastor Kenny Grant says, Myron, don't ever try to be somebody else, because if you do, nobody's there. The person you're trying to be ain't there, and you ain't there, so nobody's there. Yeah. So let's all be here today and be who God made us to be. So in Daniel chapter 1, uh, Daniel chapter chapter 3, verse number 1, it says, And Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height was three score cubits, and the breadth thereof was six cubits. And he set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to, uh, sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, um, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the province to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes and the governors and the captains and the judges and the treasurers and the counselors and the sheriffs and all the rulers of the province were gathered together unto the dedication of the, uh, uh, unto the, dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar set up, that they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And an herald cried aloud, to, who, uh, to you it is commanded, O people, nations and language that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, uh, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. And whoso, fail, whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, the flute, the sack, the psaltery, the, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar, had, the king, had set up. Now, that's a lot of people. Everybody say, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. Okay, just want to make sure we're on the same page. And then it says in verse 8, Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. And they spake and said unto the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sack, but the psaltery, and the dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews amongst, uh, certain Jews that have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they brought these men before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar 
spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do ye not serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready at the time that you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the cypher, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have set up, or which I have made well. But if you worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hand? Father, thank you for your word that it is truth. Speak to us today through your word and change us that we may have the impact you put us here to have in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Well, interestingly enough, this story didn't start in chapter 3. It started in chapter 1. And Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel took a stand that they wouldn't defile themselves with the king's meat and the king's wine. And as a result of that, they made a request, not a demand, but they made a request to the, to the people that were over them and said, um, just give us 10 days and feed us pulse and water. Pulse is vegetables and water. And it says at the end of that 10 day challenge that they were healthier than all of the people who were eating the king's meat. And they got, they got promoted and God gave Daniel insight into visions and dreams and they got promoted. Well, these are Hebrews that were taken captive into Babylon and they were slaves or servants or eunuchs working for the king. And so, but they had high positions in the palace. And Apparently, just like in the workplace today, the other people who had positions were jealous of the people who God had promoted. That doesn't change, right? And so they were jealous, and, um, and they were looking for an opportunity to get their job back. And when Nebuchadnezzar made this idol, they saw this as a perfect opportunity because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, regardless of whether they were in Israel or in Babylon, they remembered the first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not worship any graven image. Right? So now they, they, they've got a decision to make. See, they were, not, they were not fair weather followers of God. They were the kind of followers of God that we do what he says, regardless of where we are, regardless of what it costs, regardless of what it takes. And so when the, when the music played and the a sea of humanity, it said all nations, all languages, everybody in the sound of the music is going to bow down. And in the sea of humanity, there were only three people that were still standing. Let me ask you a question. As society moves more and more and more away from the truth of God and closer and closer and closer to the lies of the world, the flesh, and the devil, are you willing to stand in the presence of a sea of humanity who is bowing down and capitulating to everything because they want to get ahead or they want to preserve their life or they want to preserve their status? Are you willing to stand regardless of cost? Because they didn't bow down. They stood up. And I believe one of the biggest problems that we have in the world today, I believe that we have too many pastors that are unwilling to stand up yeah. and unwilling to speak truth because they believe somehow that it's more important for a church to be relevant than it is to be righteous. There are far too many believers who are more interested in fitting in than they are in being faithful. And so what we've got to do, we've got a decision to make. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't make that that decision that morning when they got up. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had already decided long before the music was played, composed, created, or practiced, we are not bowing down to a false god. And, and see, here's what happens. You have to have some principles that go deeper than the current era. Than the current age, than the time in which we live. You gotta, you gotta be willing to, to submit yourself to some principles where you won't sign the banana and be one of the bunch. Where you won't go along to get along. Where you won't, where you won't get in where you can fit in. But you'll stand out where you stand out. And these men, they stood up when everybody else bowed down. So what is it that we're supposed to stand for? The first thing we must stand for is truth. And by the way, we have to understand the nature of truth if we are going to stand for truth. Right? We can't stand for truth if we don't even know what truth is. And by the way, we live in a world that does not know what truth is. So the first observation about truth is this. Truth is not subjective. Yeah. 
That's right. That's right. Truth is objective. What does that mean? Subjective means it changes depends on whose truth it is. Right? You know, we live in a world now where people talk about his truth and her truth and your truth and my truth. But in reality, there's no such thing as his truth, her truth, your truth, my truth. There's only the truth and anything that's not the truth is a lie. <laughs> So stand up for the truth. How do we know truth? Well, uh, the way we know truth is by studying God's word because God's word is truth. Now, when you understand, when you understand the anatomy of truth, when you understand what truth is, because Hebrew, in Hebrew, words are not just spilt, spelled, they're built. Mm -hmm. right? right? So English is a phonetic language. If I spell the word, if I spell the word cat, it's C-A-T. The letter C doesn't have a meaning. The letter A doesn't have a meaning. The letter T doesn't have a meaning. I just know it's a cat. Yes. Right? A lot, of, a lot of Eastern languages are symbolic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so words are actually pictures and symbols of things. Yeah. But the Hebrew language is both phonetic, symbolic, and constructive. So if I say H2O, you know I'm talking about water. If I say AU, you know I'm talking about gold. Why? Because I gave you the characteristics of the thing and you knew what the thing was. Well, Hebrew words that, that are spelled are also built. So the word for truth in Hebrew is the word amet. And amet is spelled aleph mem tav. Now there are a whole lot of things about that word that are interesting. One, it sounds, amet sounds like what? Amen. And amen means what? So be it. Right. Okay, so, so the word amet, aleph mem tav, every letter, every one of those letters is also a number. So the aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, mem is the middle letter, tav is the last letter, which tells us we can only know the truth about anything if we look at the beginning, the middle, and the end. Wow. And see, there are a whole lot of people looking at the beginning of some bad decisions, and because it's going well for them now, they think it's going to end well because it started well. But your best day with Satan is your your best day with Satan is your first day, and your worst day is your last day. Can I get a witness? Yeah. And so what happens is people haven't lived long enough to see how their bad decisions turned out. So because they're going along a-ok -okay right now, they think they're going to be able to go along a-ok -okay forever. Yeah. But just wait till you get to the middle, and it changes a little bit. Wait till you get to the end, and it changes a lot. The word amet shows you the beginning, the middle, and the end. But also, the letter aleph is the, I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you. The letter aleph represents God. The word Elohim begins with the letter aleph. So aleph is the letter that also El Shaddai begins with aleph. And aleph is made of two other letters. It's made of two yods and a vav. What is a yod? A yod is a hand. What is a vav? A vav is a nail. The letter that represents God is made of two hands and a nail. Oh. Not what I said. <laughs> and, 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 and one of, one of the hands is above the vav. The other hand is below the vav. And what does the nail do? What does the cross of Christ do? It connects the hand of God back to the hand of man that was severed by sin in the Garden of Eden. Mem. What is mem? Mem is the might of the ocean. What is more powerful than a hurricane? What is more powerful than a tsunami? What is more powerful than a flood? Did you know it only takes six inches of moving water to knock a grown man off his feet? That is the power of water. So when we see Allah and we see Mem, Mem is the might of the ocean. It's mighty. And then Tav is a cross or a covenant. Now, what's really interesting about that is the, 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 letter, ta, the letter Mem is mighty. The letter Tav is a cross or a covenant. But a covenant is a very interesting thing that I would say probably 97% of church going believers have no idea what a covenant is. Why? Because we think a covenant is a contract, and a contract is a covenant, but not only are they not the same thing, they're actually opposite things. Why? Because a contract is an agreement between two or more individuals based upon a mutual distrust. So if Pastor Tom and I get in a covenant together, and, and we get in a covenant together, and um, 
I'm saying to him, if you don't keep your word to me, I can take you to the law and they'll make you keep it. I, and you're saying to me, Myron, if you don't keep your word to me, I can take you to the law and make sure you keep it. That's what a contract is. A contract is an agreement between two or more individuals based upon a mutual distrust. But a covenant is an agreement between two or more individuals based upon a mutual love and trust. And when two people entered into covenant together, Pastor Tom, can you come help me? So when two people got ready to enter into covenant, stand all the way over there. They would both get an animal. So we're going to lead our animal to the place of covenant, right in the middle. Okay? And so now turn around. To face your animal. Your animal's going to be right there. He's going to face that animal. And he's going to kill your animal. Kill the animal. Very, very violent man. Okay. So, and, and, and then cut it in pieces. Okay? So I'm going to turn around and kill my animal. Cut it in pieces. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Okay, now, we both killed our animal. Stay there, stay, keep facing the animal. So when two people got ready to enter into a covenant in the Old Testament, what they would do, they would sacrifice an animal. Because the word, and they would cut it in pieces, because the word covenant means to cut. It means what? To cut. And so, I'm facing the carcass of my animal, he's facing the carcass of his animal. When we got ready to enter in that covenant relationship, we would walk in a circle around that animal, just looking at the animal, and taking in the brutality of the death of that animal. So go ahead, walk around, slowly, walk around the animal, look at the, look at the carcass of that animal, we walk around the animal, and then we come back in the middle where we were, face to face. And so now we're facing each other, come on a little bit closer, now we're facing each other, and he would take a knife in his left hand, in his left hand, cut his right hand, and I would cut my right hand, we would put our hands together, we'd bind our hands together with a rope, we, we would become covenant brothers because his blood becomes my blood and my blood becomes his blood. But not only that, we would also exchange covenant vows. And I would say, uh, Pastor Tom, I'm going to make sure that I give everything I have to protect you and yours. In this covenant relationship, I'm going to give my time, my effort, my energy, my resources, and my very life, if necessary, to protect you and yours. He's saying to me, I'm going to give my time, my energy, my effort, my resources, and everything I have to protect you and yours, and um, even his very life. And then we both point at the animal, point at your animal, and we say, if I don't keep my word to you, may what happened to that animal happen to me. Okay, y'all tracking? Yeah. And so now we become covenant brothers. My, we exchange covenant names, not just covenant promises. My name becomes Myron Tom Golden. His name becomes Tom Myron Garrett. So now we're covenant brothers. And now what happens is we've exchanged covenant names. We've exchanged covenant promises. Now, if either one of us breaks covenant, now we have to die. This is why in the Old Testament, when somebody committed adultery, mm -hmm. not an affair, mm -hmm. right, right? Let's go with God's word, not the world's word. Yeah. It's not an affair. It's not a party that you bring a gift and flowers, <laughs> right? It's, a, it's an adultery, an abomination. Mm -hmm. That's why in the Old Testament, when somebody committed adultery, they were taken outside the camp and stoned. Why? Because they broke covenant. Everybody say covenant. covenant. They broke covenant. Now, so if he and I enter this covenant together, this is a relationship between two or more individuals, not based upon a mutual distrust, but based upon a mutual love and trust. How many of y'all tracking? Wave at me, my peeps. And so now that we're in this covenant relationship, I know even when I'm not looking, he's got my six. Yes. He knows even when I'm not looking, uh, I've got his six. Yes. Right? right? Because we become covenant Brothers, there's a saying in the East, in societies of honor, that blood is thicker than milk. What does that mean? That means that blood of the covenant is thicker than two siblings that were weaned by the same mother. That were nursed by the same mother. Are y'all tracking? Yes. And so blood is thicker than milk. When you have a covenant brother, you already, you've already promised and made a promise on your life. Okay, so thank you. Give it up for Pastor, Pastor Tom, y'all. Okay, so... I did that to help you understand the nature, everybody say nature, the nature of truth. Because truth is not Myron's mighty covenant, it's not Tom Garrett's mighty covenant, the truth is God's mighty covenant covenant. Oh, by the way, I, I, I neglected to tell you that when you separate the Aleph, which represents God, from the Mem Tav, Mem Tav, it spells Met. What is met in Hebrew? Death. When you separate God from the truth, all you have left is death. When we remove God out of society, now there's more crime than there's ever been. Why? We remove God from society. When you move God from something, all you have left is death. How many of y'all track him? Wave at me, my peeps. But not only that, 
But this shows us the significance of the fact that God refers to himself as the God who cannot lie. Not the God who does not lie. Not the God who will not lie. Not the God who has not lied. But the God who cannot lie. Why can't he lie? Because me, Aleph Mem Tav. If you separate God from the truth, all you have left is death. But if God himself doesn't keep his word, then God himself has to die. And if God dies, everything ceases to exist. Absolutely. That's the nature of truth. That's why there's no his truth, her truth, your truth, my truth, their truth. There's only the truth. And anything that's not the truth is a lie. Yes. Because, see, I don't have faith in faith. Right? I don't have faith in faith. I have faith in the one who is faithful. Yes. Amen. Okay, y'all tracking. So we have to, what we have to do in an, in an era, in an era mm -hmm. of error, mm -hmm. we have to be willing to stand up for truth. Yes. And regardless of where that leads us, regardless of where that takes us, regardless of consequences, we have to be willing to stand for the truth. Now, here's the thing that a lot of believers have a problem with. We have a problem speaking the truth in love. See, we don't want to speak. The Bible does not command us to speak the truth in hate. It doesn't command us to speak the truth in anger. It doesn't command us to speak the truth in irritation, but it commands us to speak the truth in love. Let me ask you a question. Can you have a hard conversation with somebody you disagree with without becoming hard? Yes. Can you have a difficult conversation with somebody you disagree with without being difficult? Yes. See, the truth doesn't need you to get emotionally worked up in order for it to be true. Yes. Can I get a witness? Yes. Right? You can just be as calm as you want to be because you already know at the end of the day they is what it is. Yes. And I, what am I going to get worked up about? <laughs> right? It, it's, it's interesting. At, at, at my Bible study last Wednesday, I wrote something on one side of a piece of paper and then I wrote something on the other side of the piece of paper and on this side of the piece of paper I wrote I'm going to give you one thousand dollars that's what I wrote on this side of the piece of paper I said I will I will do this for anybody who wants to take this I'm gonna do it as long as you agree to the other side so ask me what's on the other side no I don't want to talk about that <laughs> So if I didn't want to talk about what's on the other side, what would you suspect? That I'm trying to hide something. See, here's what we have to understand. We have to understand the fact that if indeed people are unwilling to look, examine the opposite side of any argument, they're hiding something. Right? And, and it doesn't matter whether they hide it under the term hate speech. Yeah. Or whether they hide it under the term intolerance, or whether they hide it under the term discrimination, if you are unwilling to have a conversation about it, either you're, you're wrong and you know you're wrong, or you're afraid you might be wrong and don't want to find out you're wrong. I don't, there's nothing I believe that I'm not willing to examine. I believe the Bible is truth. But I am open to examining that because I'm not afraid that I'm going to find out that it's not true. <laughs> Can I get a witness? How many of y'all picking up what I'm putting down? And so people are unwilling to have conversations today because they're afraid somebody's going to label them. They're afraid, they're afraid that somebody, well, here's what, here's what I noticed. If you can learn to speak the truth in love and speak out against wrong Amen. without hating the wrongdoer, I think you'd be surprised how open some rational people are to at least accept the fact that we can agree to disagree. Now there are some people that are crazy enough, they don't care. Because they already know, they got, the, they got their heels dug in and wrong. But where are the followers of Christ that are willing to stand for truth? Amen. It's, it's, it's interesting. You know, when it comes to conversations about things like um, abortion, things like homosexuality, Things like um, uh, those, those two in particular, um, things that like um, gun laws. People are unwilling to examine the other side of arguments. Like, you can't know the truth about anything unless you look at the whole thing. Yeah. It doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter who I am, if I'm unwilling to look at it, I'm afraid of something. See, truth never has to be afraid of a lie. Right. Amen. But every lie has to be deathly afraid of the truth. Why? Because the truth is light and lies are darkness. Right? right? And so, I can't bring enough darkness in here to get rid of the light. 
But a little bit of light gets rid of the darkness. And more light gets rid of more darkness. And more light gets rid of more darkness. And so we have to have some people who are willing to be what? Lights. Hmm. You are the light of the world. And men do not light a candle and put it under a bushel. What's that represent? You don't hide your faith at work. Amen. Amen. Like, like your job doesn't take care of you. God provides for you. And your job is just one of those ways he does that right now. Can I get a witness? It, we, we think that we have to back in the door with our faith because somebody's going to be, here's what I found out. The people who make the most noise about people standing up and speaking up for God, they're in the minority. They just have really big mouths, so they sound like a crowd. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so stand up for truth. That's good. That's good. If you stand up for truth, God is faithful regardless of how that turns out. Now, sometimes you stand up for truth and you get thrown in the fire of furnace like these guys did. Yeah. We'll look at the consequences of that later. And it worked out okay. But sometimes you stand for the truth and you end up like John the Baptist with your head cut off. But it doesn't matter. See, that's not the, that's not the point. Amen. What happens to me is not the point. Because of, do you understand our children are watching us, our grandchildren are watching us, and if we don't stand for the truth, then the only voices they hear are the voices of lies. It's really, it's really fascinating. So, a couple things. One, um, I, I teach in the business space, like in, like in the marketplace, I teach business. I teach people who are believers in Christ, I teach people who are Buddhist, I teach people who are, who are uh, Muslims, I teach people who are whoever they are, because I'm teaching it, like their beliefs about God are not a prerequisite for them to learn from me. But I don't change the message. Amen. That way they know who they're dealing with out of the gate, right? So. Interestingly enough, like we have, I have a couple of live events for my higher level masterminds every year. And one of the things I teach the people at those events is you should stop today using profanity. It is costing you money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, it's, it's costing you way more than money. It's costing you health. It's costing you well. It's costing you relationships. It's costing you respect. I've got a three year old granddaughter. Right? Can you imagine my three-year-old granddaughter cussing at me? I can't. By the way, let me ask you a question, better question than that. If you had a three-year-old daughter, could you see your three-year-old daughter or your three-year-old son cussing at your parents? Why? Why is that not acceptable? Why? Somebody tell me. Because it's what? It's disrespectful. So here's my question. At what age does cussing at somebody become respectful? Good word. Can I get a witness? At what age does it become respectful? And I know there are church going folks who cuss. They cuss. They cuss people out. They do the whole thing. Cuss people. They come to, come to church, praise the Lord, go home, cuss out their family. Right? Go to church, praise the Lord, go to church, work on Monday, cuss out their employees or their coworkers. Y'all know this is, y'all know I'm talking for real. And, and, and then you see these celebrities, they talk about God out of one side of their mouth, and then they talk, and then they're cussing out of the other side of their mouth. And sometimes in the same sentence, it's crazy. All I'm saying is this, you don't have to change your, who you are because who you are, like, it brings you into the space you're supposed to be in. And if you hide it, it just takes you longer to get there. Amen. So stand up for truth. You know, I speak out. Here's, here's a, there, are, there are a lot of problems. Well, some people would say, well, Myron, do you believe... Do you believe that homosexuality is wrong? For instance, this is, a, this is one that's really, and this, is pro this would probably be emotionally charged even in here. You know why? Because all of us have people in our family that have declared themselves to be homosexuals, or most of us. Can I get a witness? And so we don't want to offend them, and we want to, we want to love them and accept them, but, okay, but our first loyalty should be to God Amen. and his truth. Now, I don't hate homosexuals. Like, if, if I say, well, I just don't like smoking. Like, one of my rules for me, I'm a golfer. A lot of golfers smoke. They smoke cigars because they think that's part of golf. It's what you do when you're really bad at golf to distract people from how terrible you are. Okay? Uh, okay. So, so, but I don't ride with people who smoke. 
I'm, I'm, it's not that I, I'm not condemning you. I'm just not going to let you condemn me with secondhand smoke. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right? And now, some people might, oh, yeah, why are you being so? I'm being so me. You go be so you in a different car. <laughs> and I'm okay with that. I want to breathe oxygen and drink water. Right? Okay, y'all track. So, 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 in the, when it comes to homosexuality, because it's been popularized, and by the way, I see a lot of African American folks in here, a lot of black folks in here, the fact that we have allowed the homosexual movement to hijack the word discrimination yeah. is a travesty because the, the fabric, the, the infrastructure of the United States of America was built on the backs of the free labor of our ancestors. Now, with that in mind, with that in mind, I have now and have had in the past people who are homosexuals in my mastermind. Why? Because it's not a requirement. But I'm not changing the message, right. right? They like you know who you're dealing with, and I love I, I like I treat them with respect, yeah. right? But you don't try to back me in a corner over truth. Right. You know you get these you get these famous you get these famous celebrities or uh, celebrity pastors on television, and somebody say, "Well, do you really actually believe homosexuality is wrong? Like it's a foregone conclusion that it's not?" <laughs> and then they start backpedaling. Mm -hmm. How about this for an answer? When somebody tries to back, anybody here ever been backed into a corner? Like somebody tried to back you into a corner? Right. How about this? Um, let me ask you a question before I answer that. I'd be happy to answer that. But let me ask you a question before I answer that question. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the only Son of God and the only way that a person can have eternal life? And do you believe that the Bible is the 100% accurate and literal Word of God? Yes. What would they say? What would they, but what would they say? They'd say, no, I don't believe that. Okay, so here's my question for you before I answer your question. If I don't need you to believe what I believe in order for me to believe it, why do you need me to believe what you believe in order for you to believe it? Because if it's true, it doesn't require a consensus. Right. If it's truth, it can stand on its own. Yeah. Right? It's not, it's, and by the way, that's not me hating anybody. Right. That's just me. I believe it's wrong. Yeah. I also believe fornication is wrong. Yeah. Right? I believe, I believe adultery is wrong. Yeah. Right? I believe cussing is wrong. I, I'm, 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 like, I don't have any pet thing. I just, like, why, is it, why do you believe it's wrong? Okay. I'm going to give you three words. Everybody ready? Yeah. God said so. <laughs> It's all, all the reason I need. And, and by, by the way, maybe that's not enough for some people. I'm okay with that. See, here's the difference. You are trying to force me on your, in, on your beliefs. I'm not trying to force you into mine. I celebrate your right to believe anything you want to be. Believe. Do you, boo. But, but, don't try to get me to go along so you can feel more comfortable. Right. With, regardless of whatever. And by the way, I've had, I've had, I've confronted close friends and close family members. I've confronted them personally about mm -hmm. adultery. Mm -hmm. Amen. Like one on one. Wait, bro, bro, how, how you gonna be a, how you gonna be a, how you gonna be a preacher and then be acting like this and then act like I'm okay with it? Because I'm not going along to get along. Right. 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 No, no, no. You can't. No, 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 no. What you, what you doing? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. You, you, you follow. Why? Because truth, my relationship with God is more important than my relationship with any human. Yes. Okay, so stand up for truth. Okay, but not only stand up for truth, stand up with your tribe. Right? So sometimes your, sometimes your tribe going to be in trouble. Right? Shadrach, it, it wasn't Shadrach that stood in the, Meshach and Abednego sat down. <laughs> when Meshach that stood up and Shadrach and Abednego said, no, 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 no. They stood together. Mm -hmm. Where are the people of God who are willing to stand together? You know what's really interesting? It's interesting how easy it was during the COVID propaganda demic for people in churches to become enemies with each other over something that the world has decreed. Yes. When the scripture clearly says they will know we are Christians by our love. And if you want to like if you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. Right. And if you don't want to wear a mask, like like I celebrate your right not not to wear one. Right. But 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 it's putting other people in danger. Really. Just be, okay. Y'all y'all do understand. Y'all understand how many times what they said about COVID changed. Yeah. By the way, 
I'm not, when I say propagandademic, I don't mean there was no disease. I understand COVID was a real disease. I get that. I had people in my family who got sick with COVID. Okay, y'all tracking? I'm not saying it wasn't a real disease. I'm saying they changed the lie they told more than 50 times. Yep. 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 Right? And if wearing a mask works, why do you need your neighbor to buy, wear one? And if it doesn't work, why are you wearing one? By the way, you're, I'm, I'm not saying that wearing a mask was wrong. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying let's let individuals be individuals and let's not, let, let's not help the government destroy our rights to be individuals. I believe if a person is a racist, they have a right to be a racist. It doesn't make them right, but they have a right. How many of y'all are tracking? See, the problem is, Thinking is the hardest work most people never do, so we don't ever sit down and think about this stuff. We just go around repeating what we think we heard somebody else say on CNN or Fox News or any of the rest of those yeah. Yeah. proponents of noise. <laughs> Stand up with your tribe. Amen. Stand up in times of trouble. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood, they knew the consequences. And they still stood. Do you understand what the world system is getting everybody ready for? Okay, let's see if we can mass control the people. Let's see if we can force everybody to do what we say. See, when I saw, when I saw, when I saw, like, you can't get on a cruise ship, and by the way, my wife and I love cruise ships, right? You can't get on a cruise ship unless you get a COVID shot. I'm like, well, I guess I'm not going on a cruise again. <laughs> right? And I have people in my family got COVID shots. I'm not, but, but that wasn't me. Because I, it, it literally, when they were trying to make everybody do it, it reminded me of something that I read in the Bible. What was the thing it reminded me of? It reminded me of the fact that eventually the, the cultural hypnotic societal mechanism is going to force people to have some kind of mark. Some kind of mark. And I, I, like I follow technology and I know they've already developed injectable tracking devices. They've already started injecting them in animals and in children and in old people under the guise of, well, if they get lost, we can find them. Because they're with the government and they're here to help us. Sorry. <laughs> Stand up in times of trouble. Now, by the way, do y'all do y'all understand? I am not I'm not speaking out against anybody in this church or anybody on YouTube or anywhere else who decide they want to get a COVID shot. Do you? Right? But what I am saying is this: what we have to do is we have to resist our desire to force other people to go along with us. And just if you believe something's true and you can't believe it by yourself, I promise you you have doubt. Because truth does not require a consensus. Stand up for truth. Speak up. Speak up for the God who destroys doubt. Now here's what I want you to notice. It said in verse 15. Excuse me. It said in verse 15. Here's what it says. Okay. It said, now if you be ready, because Nebuchadnezzar liked Shad, Rack, Meshach, and Abednego because they were doing good work. And he didn't want to lose some of his most productive people. So he's like, I'm going to give y'all another chance. Okay. Because, you know, by the, by the way, the king had already said, the king had already said, if you don't bow down, you're going into the fiery furnace. The same hour. They didn't bow down. And he's giving them another chance. So he really liked them. How many of y'all track it? Okay. Verse 15. And now if you be ready at the time when you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sack, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that he is able to deliver, out of my hand, deliver you out of my hands? And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said unto the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Speak up for the God who will Eliminates doubt. Hey, by the way, the word careful there doesn't mean careful like you're, you're careful, you're walking on the edge of a cliff, I don't want to fall off. Ah. Not that kind of careful. When he said we're not careful to answer thee in this matter, we are not full of anxious care about you, your idol, or your fire. Right. That's right. That's right. 
And we're not gonna we're not gonna backpedal. We're not gonna we're not gonna say it in politically correct language. We're not gonna sign the banana and be one of the bunch. We ain't gonna go along to get along. We want you to know. I, hey, hey, we want you to know. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said um, said we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. This is the first thing that came out of their mouth. We are not careful to answer you in this matter. What does that mean? I don't have any doubt. Right. I'm not afraid of what you can do to me. I'm not afraid of what your fire can do to me. I'm not afraid of the fact. Now, now the king, now the king's looking bad in front of his other people. <laughs> right? Because why? Because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were willing to stand up and speak out and say, I serve a God who eliminates all doubt. Yes, sir. Amen. Yes, sir. Come on. See, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not worried about, I'm not, I'm not going to stand and worry. Right. I'm going to stand or worry. Right. And worry left 15 minutes ago. Right. How many of y'all tracking? Right. And so, so, so I'm going to stand for God's truth mm -hmm. regardless of the consequences, regardless of where it takes me or blocks me from. If I get thrown into the fire, I get thrown into the fire, but I am going to stand. Yeah. Amen. Yes, yeah. yeah, sir. Yes. Yeah. And I'm going to stand without doubt. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting how God, it says in, it says in, um, it says in James chapter 1. This James chapter 1 is a perfect New Testament principle parallel to this story. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall. At, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Why is he writing to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad? Because he was the senior pastor at the church of Jerusalem. So he said to the 12 tribes, which are gathered, scattered abroad, greetings. Mm -hmm. And then he said, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Notice he did not say count it all joy if you fall into diverse temptations. Diverse means different kinds. Temptations means trials. You talk about a trial. Do you understand the purpose of this furnace was to try the gold? What does that mean? That means... I'll show it to you at the end. I'll show it to you. And they would put the gold in the furnace right. and they would refine it. Yeah. And, and, and when it got really hot and started melted, like melting, the dross or the stuff that wasn't gold would rise to the top. Right. And then they would shave off the top. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, y'all track. Yes, so, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Count is a perspective word. How can these men stand up in front of the most mighty king on earth and say, we are not going to have any doubt at all. We're not going to have any anxiety at all. We're just going to tell you right now, we, you can give us 17 more chances. 36 more chances. We ain't bowing down. That ain't what we do. This ain't that. Right. Amen. And what happened? What happened? It says when they stood up and when they spoke out, when they spoke out for the God who, who delivers them from doubt, the God who removes all doubt, when they stood up like that, for the God who destroys doubt, what happened was how Nebuchadnezzar felt about them began to change. See, when you stand on truth faithfully in a faithless world, and you stand for God in a godless world, and you stand for truth in a world of lies, people are going to get an attitude. Yeah. 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 No, they, 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 they ain't going to look at you and say, oh, you poor, 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 poor baby. No, that ain't what they're saying. How dare you believe that? How dare you say that? Thank you, sir. How dare you? Notice what it said. He said, uh, we're not careful. Verse 17. Then they said, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. The reason, the reason uh, that they, God destroys doubt, he, they knew he was able. They knew God was able. They knew God was more powerful than Nebuchadnezzar. They knew God was more powerful than the furnace. They knew God was more powerful than the king's mighty men. They knew God was more powerful than their situation. And they were, they were like, they already had their mind made up. This is how we do it around here. Yes, sir. He destroys doubt. Here's why, here's why followers of Christ walk around and have doubt. Because they forgot. Mm -hmm. Because they're unaware. Thank you, sir. Can I get a witness? See, do you remember the story of David 
And his father sends him to take his brothers some food while they're in a battle against the Philistines. Yeah. Yeah. And while David's bringing and unpacking the lunch, he hears these steps of this 10 foot giant that had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. And he had a spear, the spearhead of which weighed 16 pounds. And he's breathing out threatenings and he's saying, he's saying, send me a champion. See, like there's so much in the Bible when we read it doesn't mean anything to us because we don't know what a champion is. But here's what a champion is. A champion was one person that fought like my best soldier against your best soldier. Whoever wins the battles, the war's over. Right. right. That's why Goliath said, send me a man that I may fight against him. And if I kill him, then you become our servants. And then if you kill, he kills you. Uh, if he kills me, then we'll become your servants. Now, I want you to notice something. The battle, mm -hmm. the battle that the world wages against us is always the battle for who we're going to yield to. Yep. Amen. Are y'all tracking? It's not, like, it's not, it's, they don't just want you to do one thing. They just want you to bow. The world just wants you to capitulate. The devil just wants you to capitulate. What does that mean? The scripture says, resist the devil. Yield yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So what does that tell us? That's telling us we have two choices. We can either yield to God and resist the devil, or we're going to yield to the devil and resist God. How many of y'all tracking? And so, so these men were so yielded, they were so yielded, not surrendered, because surrender is not a Bible word. Surrender is not in the Bible, not one time. All to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. That sounds really good for a song, but it ain't in the Bible. Right? Surrender is something you do to a foe or an enemy, but yielding is something you can do to a family member or a friend. So, they yielded and they said, look, my, our God destroys doubt. He destroys doubt. He said, why? Because we know he's able. We know whatever you do to us, he's able to help us win. And so what happened with, with all the soldiers that were afraid when Goliath came over the hill, they went and hid. hid. I, like, I don't know if you, when you read the Bible, if you imagine the actual characters or not, but I, I'm like, I'm like they, he's unpacking a lunch and everybody starts running. <laughs> where y'all going? We, hey, hey, where, where y'all going? Did you see that giant in 10 feet <laughs> Yeah, but... David remembered the covenant that God gave Abraham. Mm -hmm. Y'all remember the covenant, don't you? Yes, Genesis chapter 12. The Lord God commanded Abram, saying, Get thee out of your country, away from your kindred, and out of your father's house. And go to a land that I will show thee. And here's what God said to him. If you do that, I'm going to give you something you can't get yourself. I'm going to bless you in ways you can't bless yourself. I'm going to take the source of your shame and make it the source of your fame. He said, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. See, David remembered his father telling him that his father told 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 him that Father Abraham told him what God said. And while everybody else had forgotten the word, David said, as soon as he heard Goliath cursing God's people, he knew Goliath couldn't win. Did you hear what I just said? Why? Because God said, I'm going to bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. Oh, he cursed me? He can't, he can't win? Why did you Why? Oh, David said, I'm going to fight him. Now, David's a little boy, maybe somewhere between 13 and 17 years old. This is a 10-foot giant. Here's, here's what 10-foot giant means. He would call Shaquille O'Neal little fella. <laughs> Y'all tracking? And, 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 and David, everybody else ran from him, and David ran towards him. And Goliath, I'm going to tear you limb from limb. He said, it's not today, bro. He said, today, he said, you, he, he said, he said, today, God is going to deliver you into my hand. And, and David prophesied over it. He said, and I'm going to slay you, and I'm going to take your head from you today. And I'm going to feed your carcass to the birds of the air. Yes, sir. Have some of that. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Because David remembered whose presence was present. Yes, sir. Amen. For God destroyed, he's the God, speak up for the God who destroys doubt. Speak up for the God who deserves a declaration. God does not deserve for you to be a secret service Christian. Amen. 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 Hey, aren't, don't you go, don't 
don't you go to, don't you go to Ambassador Word Church? Aren't, aren't you one of those Christians? Shh, I'm on an undercover assignment. I got an undercover op rock rocking right now, bro. Don't mess that up. Don't mess that up. I don't want folks to know yet. And then exactly when do you want them to know? Right. Our God demands a declaration. Here's what Christ said. He said, if you are ashamed of me before men, I will be ashamed of you before my Father, which is in heaven. Let the world know where you stand. Don't back in the doorway. Amen. Amen. Do you understand? See, we, we, we start looking at stuff, we start figuring stuff out in our carnal mind instead of, instead of just trusting what the Word says. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> I remember I spoke at this big conference in, I think it was in, the first time it was in um, Nashville, Tennessee. Like 3,000 people were there. And I started teaching them business based on biblical principles. I'm talking about Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden, all of that. <laughs> Some people were looking at me like, well, you, is he actually talking about God in public? Yes. Amen. That's exactly what I'm doing. Why? Because that's where I come from. And, I, and you knew that when you invited me to speak. So don't actually, don't, as my sister-in-law would say, don't start acting brand new now. Right. <laughs> you knew who I was when you called me up here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's a God who deserves a declaration. Where are the followers of Christ who are willing to stand up and speak up for Christ? Yeah. Yeah. By the way, you make sure when you speak up for Christ that the words that are coming out of your mouth are the works that are coming out of your members. Yeah. He's a God who deserves a declaration that matches the deeds that I do. Yeah. Yes. Oh, 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 you a Christian now. Yeah. Like... Don't be the kind of person someone can say that. They're shocked when they find out you got faith in Christ. I didn't know, I didn't know you believed that. <laughs> so interesting. Uh, at that same conference, there was this woman, and after she heard me speak, I was sitting out in the hallway, and she came up. She said, Myron, do you have a podcast? I said, oh, yeah, I got a podcast. She said, what's the name of podcast? I said, it's called Bible Success Secrets. She was like, when she asked me, she was opening her purse, already had her notepad out, already had her pen out to write down the name of the podcast. And then as soon as I said, it's called Bible Success Secrets, she said, oh. She put the notebook back in, put her pen back in, started to turn around and walk away. I said, hmm, that was interesting. What's that about? She said, oh, I'm not the religious person. I said, oh, you're one of those people. <laughs> <laughs> She said, she said, what people? <laughs> I said, you're one of those people who thinks the Bible is a book about religion? She said, Bible is not about religion? No. The Bible is a book about a king. Mm -hmm. A kingdom. Yes, sir. And a royal family. That's right. And the culturalization of a foreign land, that foreign land is called earth. Mm -hmm. So the Bible is a book about a king who wants to make you a king. But there's another fake king who wants to make you a slave. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh -huh. And this king who wants to make you a king or make you a queen, like, he's got some principles. And the principles of his kingdom are freedom, profits, abundance, and life. The tenets of the fake king's kingdom are wages, slavery, lack, and doubt. I mean, and death. She says, she, she took her pen back out, took her notebook back out, and said, what's his name of podcast again? <laughs> I told her the name of the podcast. She started listening to it. She started posting stuff that she was learning on her Facebook page every day. About a year later, guess what happens? She said, Myron, she sent me a message on, on Facebook. Myron, I've been listening to podcasts. I've been sharing podcasts. And you talk about this thing, being saved. I want to be saved. Yeah. Why? Not, not because of anything that I am, other than a witness. Right? I wasn't trying to get her, get her saved, as, like trying to get her saved. I wasn't trying to get her saved. That's not my responsibility. My responsibility is to water and to sow. It's God's responsibility to give the increase. My responsibility is to be a witness. The witness is not the prosecuting attorney, not the defense attorney, and not the judge. The witness's job is to speak about what they've seen and heard and let the process do what only the process can do. How many of y'all tracking? And so, 
Praising God that de declare, deserves a declaration. But I want you to notice this. This is the part we forget. I, I'm going to go back and read it for you so you know I ain't making this up. It says, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us out of the fiery furnace, and he will. So not only is he able, but he's also willing. So he's able to deliver us, and he's willing to deliver us. You know what's really interesting about that? There are people in the world who are able to help us when we're in need. But they just ain't willing. Can I get a witness? But there are people who are willing to help us, but they ain't able. Right. This is not a person. This is the God of the universe. He's both able and willing. Mm, that's so good. Right? Because now I don't have to worry about his ability or his desire. They're both in my direction. Okay, y'all track. And then it says... Um, uh, verse 16, we're not careful to answer this, no matter if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us out of the fiery furnace, uh, deliver us out of the fiery furnace, out of, deliver us out of thy hand, O king. And then they said something like this. They said, but if not, but even if he doesn't, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which you have set up. So, I want you to understand something. Our God is able to deliver us. And he will. But if he doesn't, we still ain't bound down. See, what we need in 2023 is some but if not Christians. Some, God, some Christians who trust in the sovereignty of God. Some followers of Christ who know that we're not going to be more than conquerors. Or we might be more than conquerors, but we already are more than conquerors through him that loved us. I don't have to wait till I get to the end of my life to find out how it ends. I don't have to wait till the world ends to find out how it ends. I already know. I read the last chapter and we've already won. Some people, some people say, well, how could you say you've already won? We got to understand. So sometimes I talk about science, sometimes I talk about the Bible, and eh, these were some very interesting observations, right? So, interestingly enough, have you ever thought about the fact that in the realm of time, everybody say time. In the realm of time, there's no such thing as the present. The present. What do I mean by that? As soon as I say now, it becomes then. I mean, as soon as I say now, then. As soon as I say now, then. As soon as I say now, then. So in the realm of time, there are only two times. What are they? The past and the future. The present can't exist in time. Why? Because of the past and the future. How many of y'all tracking? But in eternity, everybody say eternity. In the realm of eternity, there's no such thing as the past or the future. There's only the present. By the way, that's why God is the I am that I am, not the I was that I was. <laughs> See, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't think of God as the God who was Abram's God, right. Isaac's God, right. Joseph's God, right. Moses' God, but not theirs. Right. They thought of God as the I am, as their present God. Right. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore shall not we fear though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Yeah. He's a present God. Why? He can't be any other way. The scripture tells us so many things that we don't understand because we don't understand the nature of God's present tenseness. See, eternity is the forever now. Did I say that too fast? Eternity is the forever now. And when God told Moses, tell him, I am that I am has sent thee. I am. First of all, what kind of question is that? Who shall I say has sent you? That's the best question you got, Moses? Like, I would have said, okay, God, when I go into Pharaoh's house and I tell him, you said, let my people go, can you please tell me what, what I should tell him you said you're going to do if he say no? That's what I would have said. <laughs> Moses didn't bother with none of that. Didn't care. You know what he said? Here's what he said. Who shall I say has sent me? Why? Because he understood that authority is always an alignment issue. Who shall I say has sent me? Tell him that the I am that has sent me. 
I am that I am. Which I am? The I am that said, in the beginning, God said, let there be light. And there was light and God saw the light that was good. I am that I am. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. And God separated the light from the darkness and the light that he called day and the darkness he called night. I am that I am. Right. Yes. Yes. Oh, that fire you made? And that fire you made? That one right there? Oh, no, 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 no. You thought you put yourself there? I put you there. I am that I am. Yes. Oh, 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 you think you're Pharaoh because you that good? Mm -mm. You Pharaoh because promotion don't come from the east or the west or the north or the south. Promotion comes from the Lord. Yes. I am that I am. Yes. Mm -hmm. Are y'all tracking? Yes. And so in eternity, in eternity, there's no such thing as the past or the future. That's why God knows the end from the beginning. That's why there's no difference between prophecy and history because it's all the same thing. What's a moving picture to us is a still shot to God. <laughs> wow. Amen. And it's hard for us to wrap our minds around because everything that we experience in life is bound by time, space, and matter. But eternity is not bound by time. Amen. Time is a segment of eternity. Mm -hmm. It's a manifestation within eternity. That's why God is the I am and I am. How many of y'all track him? And so he said, they said, our God is able, whom we serve is able to deliver us out of your hands, and he will, but if he doesn't, we still ain't bound down. See, we need some, some followers of Christ that are willing to trust God when, here it is, stand up, speak out for the God who delivers his people into danger. Yeah. Wait, 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 time, 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 time out. He does what? He delivers his people into danger. No, 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 God don't do that. Really? So why did he tell Moses, a stuttering shepherd, to go tell the king, I said, let my people go. You don't think that's dangerous? <laughs> Does it get any more dangerous? Why, why did God separate the Red Sea with a wall of water on the left and a wall of water on the right, and you can't see what's holding that water back? Why did he tell them, step into the water? Why, why did he say, like, walk across the Red Sea on dry land? Two million people walk across. God delivers his people into danger. Why? So he can show us he's greater than the danger he delivered us into. Yeah. Good work. Yeah. And see, we, we get close to danger. We start, oh, we start huffing and puffing and hyperventilating and having an anxiety attack. Why? Because we forgot who brought us there. Yeah. <laughs> See, if we never enter into a situation that requires God, then we will never become fully aware of who our God is. Amen. Yeah. We, isn't it interesting? The scripture says, now faith. What kind of faith? Now faith. Right. Why does it say now? It says now because now is the only kind of situation that requires that you have faith. You've got to enter into a now situation, situation that requires that you have now faith. Yeah. Now faith is the substance. Sub, the prefix sub means under. So when I get on a submarine, I go under the water. When I get on a subway, I go under the street. The subfloor is under the floor. Sub means under. Y'all tracking? Okay. It says now faith is the substance. So whatever faith is, it's something in the now that I'm standing on. Okay. So now faith is where I stand. On what? things hope for. What's the word hope mean? Doesn't mean a wish. It's not a wish. What is it? It's the well-founded, well-grounded expectation for the future. So I've got an empowered expectation for the future because of the I am that is already in my future and has already declared my future and has already finished my future and I already won. Amen. I don't have to wonder how it's going to turn out because it's already turned out how it's going to turn out. The scripture says, but our God, he is in the heavens and he hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. God doesn't answer to me or you or anybody else. God don't answer to people because they're famous. Nope. Amen. He don't answer preachers because they have degrees. God only answers to himself and the words that he has spoken. And so now faith is the substance of things hoped for. What's the word things mean? Amazing word. Here's the word things means in the Greek. Things. <laughs> now faith is where I stand on the things I expect. So my expectation of a thing is the thing I expect. Okay. Are y'all tracking? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence. What's the word evidence mean? 
proof of things not seen. So what is the word? What is what is what is Hebrews 11 1 telling us? Now faith is where I stand on the things I expect while I prove the things I cannot see. Yeah. Now faith is where I stand on the things I expect while I prove the things that nobody in my family's ever seen. Now faith is where I stand on the things I expect while I prove things the people in my church have never seen, my community, my job have never people in the world have never seen. Now faith is where I stand on the things I expect while I prove the things I cannot see. Yes. Amen. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego served a but if not God. The kind that delivers his people into danger. See, no, no, God, don't do that. No, no, no. You may not have let him do that for you yet. But until you do let him do that, let him come walking to you on the storm in the middle of the night, until you do do that, you will never truly understand the nature of the God we serve. Stand up. Speak out. I'm sorry, stand up. Speak up. Speak up for the God who destroys doubt. Speak up for the God who de declares, deserves a declaration. Speak up for the God who delivers his people from through danger. Through danger. God delivers them through the Red Sea, uh, 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 through, through, through a battle with the might. He got some slaves coming out of Egypt. How does he bring them out of Egypt? Well, he's got a pillar of fire by day and a pillar of cloud by night. So when the enemy tried to attack through the cloud, they couldn't see. And when they tried to attack through the fire, they got destroyed. That's the God we serve. Yes. Amen. And then watch, watch what happens. Nebuchadnezzar, y'all remember the question he asked, right? Right before he got ready to throw him in the furnace? He said, and who is that God that is able to deliver at my hand? Do you understand? That is the question that's on the top of mind of all the people in the world who are watching so-called followers of Christ. But who are watching real followers of Christ as well. Who is that God that's going to deliver you from the situation that's coming. That's coming. Who is that God that's going to cause you, to, who's going to destroy your doubt in the face of a very angry enemy? Watch what it says. In verse number, uh, verse number 18. But if not be known unto thee, we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Can you imagine? These guys are Enoch's talking to the king in front of his royal subjects, in front of his princes and his governors and his counselors and the sheriffs. Oh, y'all tracking? Okay, here's what it says. Uh, as soon as they said that, verse 19, then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against the uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore spake, he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. Do you know when you stand for God, it will cause some people to lose their mind? Yeah. He said, heat the furnace seven times hotter than it needs to be heated. I'm going to kill y'all seven times deader than anybody's ever been killed. <laughs> How's that work? I mean, last I checked, you throw somebody in the fire, irregardless of how hot it is. I know the words regardless, okay. I know it's regardless. I can promulgate my esoteric cogitations with the best of them, okay. But sometimes I use poor grammar for emphasis. Regardless of how hot the fire is, it's still fire. Right. And if you throw folk in it, Folk gonna burn up. Okay, y'all track it. Okay. But he lost his mind. He said, oh, I'm so. Heat it up! Heat it up! Throw me in! He went, he lost his mind. I'm, I'm starting to feel like I'm in the fire train. <laughs> getting, a little, getting a little warm. Okay. So, it says, um, it was one to be heated, verse 20, and he commanded, I want you to watch this now, the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Y'all know these wasn't some little bitty shoestring ropes and they just kind of, with a little, pretty little bow. No, 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 no. The most might, when the most mighty men tie you up, they start cutting off circulation and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all track it? He's a, he's a, um, Commanded most mighty men who was in his army to sh bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats and their hosen and their hats and their other garments and were cast into the midst. They threw them all. These are mighty men. Here goes one. <laughs> cast them into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. 
And then it says in verse 22, therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the fire exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those, slew those men that stood up, that took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Wait, 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 wait what happened? Nebuchadnezzar just killed his most mighty men. That's how hot the fire was. And then it says, Then the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we throw, cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. And he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose and walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like unto the Son of God. This is one of my favorite stories in all of Scripture. Why? Because this is when you can show up. See, I don't want to show up by myself. I don't want the world to see me do anything by myself. Because Jesus said, without me you can do nothing. Amen. Hey, 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 I ain't showing up to show me off. I'm showing up to show him off. That's right. And they said, we're going to allow ourselves to go through this difficulty, through this trial, through... It's so many, there's, so, there's so many things in here. We, we want to God... We want to be able to show up in adversity. We got to show up in adversity. Do you know, anybody can receive a blessing with a smile. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you a question, follower of Christ. Do you have the ability to go into the fiery furnace of life and still have joy in your heart? What kind of joy? The kind of joy you count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation. Doesn't that sound like what they just did? Mm -hmm. yep. Knowing this. So count is a perspective word, right? You have, have this perspective. Assign this meaning to it. Joyfulness. God is not telling us to count it all joy because we love going through trials. I don't love going through trials. Is there anybody else here who does not love going through trials? I don't love going through trials. I've never been through a trial that I love going through. Amen. I've gone through some trials that I knew were trials, and I knew I was going to go through them before I went in them, but I wasn't about to enjoy it. I, wasn't, I, wasn't, I just love trials. That's so ridiculous. That's not what God is saying. He said, count it joy. How can I count a trial joy? Here's how I can count a trial joy. Because of what it says next. Try, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this. See, count is a perspective word. No is a perception word. Right. So he's, and if you don't know what you need to know, you can't count how you're supposed to count. All right. He said, knowing this, the trying of your faith work with patience. What does that mean? Well, it means patience, the word patience is consistent, persistent endurance. I'm supposed to, am I supposed to be done already, aren't I? Okay. Wow. I thought that said 857. It says 957. Okay. I'm going to wrap it up. I'm going to wrap it up. I'm going to wrap it up. Sorry, guys. I got, I got carried. In adversity. Show up in adversity. Show up in awareness. Aware of what? Aware of the presence of Christ. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were so aware of the presence of Christ that everybody else who was there could also see him. And then show up in authority. What was the authority? There are three kinds of fire in the Bible. I'm going to tell you what they were. Number one, there's the fire that doesn't burn. That's the kind of fire that showed up and called Moses. There's the fire that does burn. That's the kind of fire that Elijah called down from heaven to destroy his enemies. And the most amazing fire in the entire Bible is the fire in Daniel chapter 3. What's that? That's the fire that burns some folk and don't burn other folk. Why? Because when you show up in authority, God demonstrates his authority in your situation. And fire, something that consumes, consumed the men that threw them in but could not consume them. Our God is a God who delivers. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is truth. May we stand up. May we speak up. And may we show up as your true, authentic representatives in the marketplace. In the name of Yeshua, amen. amen.